Final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 13357 in the name of Duncan McNeill on the extension of the Blue Badge eligibility criteria. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Mr McNeill, if you are ready. Um, I'd be grateful if you could speak for seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to have this de debate uh, on this motion tonight. Uh, and I thank all of the members from across all of the parties who have supported it and those who have stayed behind this evening uh, to participate in the debate or listen to the debate. Um, I think it would be useful to set out um, you know, why... I became interested in this issue, um, and in January this year, I was contacted by a worried parent, a Mr. McLevy, uh, whose son, Aidan, uh, suffers from Down syndrome. I had the pleasure of meeting Aidan and Mr. McLevy in my office, and, and, a, and a, an energetic um, a child is, is Aidan, um, uh, full of enthusiasm. Um, I think he might have did a bit of damage to the office that day, but he's forgiven. Um, <laughs> But uh, they were there on a serious matter, and that serious matter was that uh, uh, Aidan uh, had a blue badge which allowed his parents to park uh, easily and conveniently, not uh, what they had to do when it was withdrawn, which was, of course, having to park uh, some distance away from uh, venues, whether that venue was a local supermarket, the doctors, the family centre, which, which, as a consequence, I think we all realise means that that family and that child have to struggle with the day-to-day -day activities most of us take for granted. Uh, this, this is because of Aidan's condition. He has a lack of safe, safety awareness. Uh, he can be unpredictable. Uh, he can pose a danger to himself and indeed his parents uh, chasing after him in a busy car park. He also has a, a lack of coordination uh, and can trip easily. And as a result of getting from a car to the entrance of a venue, it can be a, a daunting experience uh, for, for his parents. Aidan had his badge taken away because he does not meet the new strict criteria uh, for the scheme. Um, first, firstly, Aidan does not receive the higher mobility rate of disability living allowance, which means that he does not automatically qualify when he applies to the local authority. Um, if a young person like Aidan does not receive the higher uh, rate of DLA, the local authority then goes through the process of assessment. However, new to the strict criteria, um, the, the, to issue the, 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 the blue badge, the local authority must satisfy, that, uh, satisfy themselves that the applicant is unable to walk or virtually <coughs> unable to walk. And it's clear from uh, meeting uh, uh, and speaking with Mr McLevy, that having that blue badge, although he doesn't fit that criteria, having the blue badge with, withdrawn, uh, it, it, it was an essential uh, in allowing his family to go about the day-to-day -day activities that most of us, as I say, take uh, for granted. However, it isn't just a, an issue that, uh, that, that affects the McLevys. And, and Green Up Down Syndrome Scotland have informed me that I've have been contacted by a, a, a number of worried parents whose children's application for blue badges have been rejected. It's also impacting on parents with children who have autism, who, due to their condition, can be prone to running off or uh, having learning difficulties, which makes it uh, difficult for them to appreciate danger. Um, and, and I will re read you an extract from a submission uh, made uh, by a concerned parent to transport Scotland's consultation on extending the Blue Badge scheme to people with mental health conditions, which was launched uh, way, back, uh, way back in September 2013. She said, my son refuses to walk at any time. Unpredictably, he also throws tantrums uh, if we are in a strange place with loud noise. We live in an extremely busy place and there is never any parking at the doctors or the shops. My son has irrational fears. He does not speak, so we cannot calm him by talking things through. He literally needs to be hand handled very physically to stop him either running away into the road or refusing to walk at all. I hope these case examples convey 
the real impact, the real difference that having a blue badge would make to the lives of these families and how difficult their lives are made without them. Now, as I've just alluded to a few moments ago, Transport Scotland launched a consultation a full two years ago to gauge the views on whether the Blue Badge criteria should be extended to include those who, as a result of diagnosed mental condition, have little or no awareness of danger from traffic and are likely to compromise their safety or the safety of others as a result. The analysis of the results was, was published a full year later, now December 2014. There were overwhelming support from that, that consultation that such an extension uh, should be made available. The 30 groups and individuals and organisations that submitted their views supported that conclusion. This, this is include, including the likes of local authorities like Renfrewshire Council, Orkney Council, the Artistic Society Scotland, the Western Isles Advocacy. It's, 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 on the, it's on the public record. I understand the Scottish Government this month has set up a working group to consider whether the Blue Badge scheme should be extended and we, we very much welcome this development. However, we cannot ignore the fact that it's been two years since we first called for evidence and that, and that, and that consultation had begun. Uh, you know, and the, the time is now. Uh, Wales, of course, have led, uh, uh, said to be late, have led the way in this issue. In December last year, they extended the eligibility so that people who, as a result of a mental disorder, are unable to follow the route of a familiar journey without assistance of another person will automatically receive the blue badge. As Down Syndrome Scotland said, the longer it takes to address the issue, the more families will struggle to cope with everyday activities. This issue is significantly affecting the quality of life of children and adults with Down syndrome and autism throughout the country, including young Aidan, who has now gone nearly 10 months without his blue badge. I hope the Scottish Government Working Group will agree to change the eligibility criteria and implement that change as quickly as realistically possible so that families like the McLevies can go about their everyday lives more easily. And I look forward tonight to hear what the Minister has to say in this matter. And I hope that he would agree that progress should be made quickly. Thank you. Thanks very much. I now call on Dennis Robertson to be followed by Cameron Buchanan. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the member for bringing this very important topic to the Chamber this evening. Uh, the member will recall, Presiding Officer, that um, the, the blue badge was something that I was very much involved in uh, with my own member's bill. And at that time, we're looking at the enforcement. Uh, and as part of the enforcement, we actually did uh, look at the, uh, not the eligibility criteria, but to ensure that reviews were a part of that, the bill that was taken forward. And this meant that the, the local authorities had the power to ensure that reviews were carried out in terms of meeting criteria. Now, like Mr. McNeil in his case study that he mentioned, I too, and I'm sure many other MSPs, in every constituency and region of Scotland, presiding officer, will have similar case studies to the one Duncan McNeill expressed this evening. I certainly have had the occasion to speak uh, directly with families when a, ba a badge has been coming up for renewal and their fear is that the badge will not be renewed. And in several occasions, the badge had not been renewed. And this was due to the fact that the situation was that the young person with their condition, in this case I'll refer to as a, a, a young boy with autism, with a very, I think, uh, recognised uh, individual problems, his badge was indeed refused. And this because he was no longer passported through the benefit system in terms of the higher rate of mobility. However, on an appeal, and the appeal was assisted by um, a, a friend <clears throat> uh, who worked within the uh, CAB. And it was, the, the, although the person could articulate themselves and was very articulate indeed and understood the criteria and the forms, etc., 
she, she was aware that perhaps the language we use sometimes when we're going through an appeal process needs to be so specific um, to the uh, uh, appeals that it is something that uh, is more, in a sense, understood and using their language to meet the criteria. The presiding officer is blatantly, blatantly obvious sometimes that a blue badge is required. And yes, often uh, the, the walking eligibility is not met. It's not met because in terms of Down syndrome, autism and some other, uh, 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 other conditions, uh, a young person or even an adult may not meet that walking criteria, but their need for assistance, their need to be able to have a parking space close to, uh, whether it be a doctor's surgery or a leisure facility, is irrelevant to some extent. But they require to have a parking space close to, so they're not walking through car parks. They're not walking through, perhaps, uh, the, the entrances to a, a very busy traffic junctions, etc. And this is why it's so important that we ask people to use a bit of common sense presiding officer when they're looking at eligibility and look at the personal circumstances of each single application. Certainly when I went through my bill, we had many, many people asking us to look at the criteria. It was out with the scope of my bill. However, it was something that I felt very strongly about and I'm delighted that Duncan McNeil has brought this to the chamber this evening. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you very much. I now call on Cameron Buchanan to be followed by Cara Hilton. Thank you, presiding officer. Sorry. Can I add my thanks to Duncan McNeill for bringing this important issue before us this evening. The flexibility that the blue badge gives people with mobility problems should not be underestimated. And the extension of the scheme to include passengers with disability means that drivers can take friends or family members to the desired location far more easily. Please excuse my voice, it's a bit croaky today. This debate rightly focuses on Transport Scotland's findings following its call for evidence on extending the scheme to include individuals with mental health conditions. Duncan McNeill's motion makes explicit mention of Down syndrome. I agree with him that in parents in particular face huge challenges in everyday life with children who have, this, who have this condition. This includes having to park sometimes a long distance away from, for example, shops or the high street they intend to visit, never mind doctor's surgeries. Children with Downs often do not have a full understanding of the dangers posed by traffic in that there is sometimes a tendency to wander off or to be unfamiliar with certain route. It should be emphasised and recognised that just because a child can walk ably, this does not mean that he or she is not a danger to themselves or others with passing vehicles. A blue badge would help address those concerns by allowing parents to park outside, excuse me, or as near to the venue that they wish to visit as they can. The motion also refers to the discrepancy between the assessment process for under 16-year-olds, including young children and teenagers, and all those over 16. Whilst I do support the Conservative Government's welfare reforms to tackle the culture of dependency, sadly one of the knock-on effects of such measures means that changes to the rate paid in mobility allowance for those children with Downs has led to changes in the issuing of blue badges. I personally believe that this is an anomaly which needs to be rectified as soon as possible. I would support Transport Scotland's working group in investigating how, close we, how we can close this loophole that connects benefits and parents having blue badges of their children with Downs. Of course, Downs is not the only condition which should be covered by the blue badge. Autism is a condition which alone affects nearly 5,000 people in Edinburgh, including 850 children, approximately. Duncan McNeill has already spoken of his, constituency, of his constituent, Aidan McLevy from Greenock, who has Downs. I would like to mention one of my constituents, Owen Martin, whose nine-year-old son, Theo, has autism and has recently lost his blue badge due to, due to changes in assessment. Although Theo can walk for 40 metres, which is a new criteria for accessing eligibility, this does not take into account the fact that when his father parks, he can no longer use the disabled space. Often this means parking some distance from their home in Edinburgh, with the consequence that Theo's hand has to be held, has to be held at all times. Children with autism often have sensory overload issues, which can lead to them having what I understand is termed a meltdown, caused by noise and sound such as from those vehicles. As Owen, as Owen said, to me, you have to hold on to him the whole time because if you turn around for a second, he'll be off. 
Calling the presiding, presiding officer, I reiterate that this is an important debate which I do hope Transport Scotland will take note of during the course of, the working, of its working group. Whilst we are all conscious that there are incidents of the Blue Badge Scheme being abused by some unscrupulous individuals, it makes perfect sense to me that the Blue Badge Scheme should not be restricted to those with mobility issues. People with mental health problems, especially children, should not be discriminated against, and I therefore wholly support this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Cara Hilton to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by congratulating my colleague Duncan McNeill on securing this important debate tonight, highlighting the need for the Scottish Government to extend the eligibility criteria for the Blue Badge Scheme. I would like to take the opportunity to highlight the case of one of my constituents, Philip, who has got autism. My constituent is in his early 20s and he's been told that he's not eligible for a Blue Badge. He was told that the assessment has to be based on his walking functionality, not on his autism. Yet Philip's autism means he's unable to negotiate traffic and has got very little sense of danger. He's unable to go anywhere without his parents, who moved up from Scotland to Scotland from Yorkshire to make a better life for their family, but now are virtually trapped indoors. And sadly, my constituent has had to give up a work placement that he secured as a result of this decision. Philip has been told that he will qualify when he's moved on to personal independence payments, but that he is in the, one of the last groups to be moved over and so has just got to wait. No indication has been given of how long his wait will be. He's already been waiting for more than a year. Presiding, Deputy President Officer, this is simply unacceptable. As members will be aware, the Welsh Government has already extended the Blue Badge criteria in Wales to include individuals that can't follow the route of a familiar journey with another person. And if my constituent lived in Wales, he would be automatically entitled to a Blue Badge right now. I know that the Scottish Government have established a working group to look at this, but progress has simply been too slow, and I think this really is undermining people's quality of life. As other colleagues have uh, mentioned already, having a blue badge isn't just about being able to get part. It plays an absolutely vital role in helping people overcome the many barriers and struggles that they face every day um, in accessing jobs, services, leisure and social opportunities. Without a blue badge, many people like my constituent Philip are being forced to become prisoners in their own homes. Duncan McNeill's motion highlights the case of children under 16 who are being assessed more strictly than those over 16, meaning that men, many no longer qualify for the higher rate of mobility allowance, which triggers a blue badge. The many parents and carers are now faced with walking long distances with their children, and for a parent of an autistic child, as Cameron McCannon has already highlighted, this can be a real challenge, especially when a child is prone to running off, to having sudden meltdowns due to sensory overload, or simply having no perception of risk or danger, and there's often little in the way of public sympathy or, or support. As a result, many families with children on the autistic spectrum feel isolated, cut off from family and friends and from the wider community, from the activities that many of us enjoy and take for granted with our children. In The Scotsman last week, I read an article by Sophie Pilgrim of Kindred, which is an organisation which supports families of children and young people with additional needs. And she summed up the difference a blue badge makes very well. She said, getting a blue badge restores some of the normal to family life. Par parking up right next to the shop door can make a dreaded shopping trip manageable. If you've got a, children, a child with ASD, you know that any trip out has to pl be planned with an exit strategy. She added, with a blue badge, at least you don't have to walk for miles dragging a screaming, hyperventilating child to the, wonders, to the wonder of passers-by. Deputy Presiding Officer, it's time for the Scottish Government not just to recognise the plight of my constituent and the other constituents that members have talked about today. It's about time to recognise the plight of families right length, up and down the length of Scotland. It's time to act. The longer it takes to get this sorted, the longer families are going to have to struggle to cope. Um, no, no time, sorry. Uh, with the day-to-day -day activities affecting the quality of life and well-being of children in Dunfermline and right across Scotland. So it's time now for the Minister for Scotland to follow Wales's lead. And I look forward to hearing what the Minister has to say later. Uh, Presiding officer, extending the eligibility of the Blue Badge would transform the opportunities available to my constituent and it would help transform the lives of many families across Scotland who have got children with conditions like Down syndrome and autism. The time is for action now and I'm really grateful to Duncan McNeill once more for bringing this important issue to the Parliament tonight. Thanks very much. Now call on Mark Macdonald to be followed by Hans Alan Malik. Uh, th thank you very much, um, Presiding Officer. And I, I guess, just in case I stray into those areas, I would highlight on my register of interest that I'm a member of the Advisory Committee for the National Autistic Society in Scotland. Um, I'm going to try my best, Presiding Officer. It's really difficult in these debates not to bring my personal 
circumstances into this. We've never uh, held a, a blue badge for my son nor, nor sought to, to get one for him. So I, I don't speak from that perspective. But I do know of many uh, individuals um, who have either held a badge previously or, or sought to apply for one. And I think that the, the points that have been made around the challenges that are faced by families uh, with uh, a child uh, or an adult on the autistic spectrum are, are, are very well made. Uh, I think often it can be taken for granted um, how difficult and challenging it can be to plan a family trip uh, or day out uh, or even a trip to the supermarket um, where uh, while it is possible to use parent and child parking spaces if those all happen to be full, uh, families can find themselves parking a great distance away from the store where the child has no concept of danger uh, and is liable to uh, escape and uh, those who have spent time with families uh, with uh, a child on the autistic spectrum will know that many children in the autistic spectrum are expert escapologists. Um, that it can be a very fraught and challenging experience to negotiate a car park, and that's something which many people would would not uh, would not have cognizance of. I'll give way to my friend Dennis Robertson. On. Dennis Robertson. Uh, I'm grateful to my friend and colleague uh, Mark McDonald. Uh, Mr. McDonald has uh, mentioned obviously it, it, it's, it's the families. And quite often, when a trip uh, going out, presiding officer, is if you've got an autistic, an autistic child or someone, uh, a child with Down syndrome, it's more than just that child. There's others to be considered as well. So we're actually looking at the health, the, the safety of not just that individual, but maybe other members of the family. I, I, I take on board entirely the point that my colleague makes, and I have constituents who have uh, number, a number of children, three or four children, one of whom perhaps has a, a complex disability, which means that they can often face difficulties uh, around uh, planning trips and, and things like that. And obviously, they cannot always give their full attention to the, to the child who is on the autistic spectrum or, or, or with Down syndrome if they have other siblings that they have to to look after at the same time as well. So th that point is well made. Uh, I would highlight the case of uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Glyn Morris, who uh, lives in uh, Murray and is the, uh, amb an ambassador for the National Autistic Society Scotland. Uh, Glyn <coughs> has a 16-year-old son, Gregor, um, and he says that Gregor's disability uh, doesn't make uh, having a badge a luxury, it makes it a necessity. Um, Gregor's focus uh, is on getting to where he's going uh, and means that he has no regard for other things like traffic or people uh, who he may come into contact with. Uh, while Gregor may be able to follow the route of a familiar journey uh, unassisted, he may not be able to do so safely. And I think that's an important distinction that we need to make, is it's not just about an uh, individual's ability to walk unaided, it's an ability to do so safely. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, think that the point that uh, has been made around the extension of the criteria is well made. I would note the evidence that was received, uh, particularly from the National Autistic Society Scotland, that perhaps the terminology is crude uh, in its application and perhaps looking at cognitive difficulties uh, might be a, a better way of expressing something because there are many who would consider mental disorder or mental health impairment to be a crude uh, way to describe Down syndrome or autism, and that perhaps needs to be looked at. So one other thing, if I may, President, I'll just flag up is, uh, it probably sits out with this, but is worth, worthy of consideration, is that obviously the uh, situation that Cameron Buchanan uh, described of the impact of welfare reform, particularly the reduction from 50 metres to 20 metres when it comes to the uh, higher rate of mobility, uh, is going to potentially exclude a number of individuals, particularly uh, has been highlighted by MS Society Scotland, uh, the potential impact that that could have. And that may be something following on from this consultation that the Minister may want to turn his attention to, because if that uh, follows through into how people are being assessed, there are individuals who currently would qualify for a blue badge under the 50 metre regulations who may find their blue badge being taken away from them because the 20 metre regulation uh, doesn't necessarily uh, class them as people who would require that higher rate of mobility. So I just flag that up as a potential future consideration. Any anyway, thanks? Now call on Hans Alamalek, after which we move the closing speech from the Minister. Thank you very much and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. I would like to thank Duncan McNeil for securing today's debate. Thank you, Duncan. 
In my many years as a Glasgow City Councillor, I have had many constituents come to me questioning the fairness of the scheme. The blue badge eligibility has historically been assessed on mobility and the person's ability to walk a certain distance. The consultation on the eligibility criteria to increase people with mental health is welcome. The consultation responses show an overwhelming support for broadening criteria that look at the ability of a person to walk safely and independently rather than just simply a distance. I wholeheartedly support any change that will enhance the blue badge system to those who require it and that will make the system fair and enhance the quality of life and of people who need it the most. The problems highlighted by uh, Down Syndrome Scotland about the an anomaly between children aged under 16 receiving disability living allowance and those receiving personal independence payments is unfair and unacceptable. One of the reasons for the Smith Commission recommended that powers over benefits for people who are ill or disabled was so that the Scottish Parliament can identify and respond to these issues itself. And that also is welcome. I have one uh, note of caution that we broaden the criteria to include the, the very, every, wild, every range for disabilities and conditions that is needed. However, local authority staff need to have the skill and ability to assess the need for the blue badge fairly. There is little point in making the laws more accessible if we still do not apply uh, the, the, the rules uh, on a ad hoc management system. In addition, the, lo the local authorities need to ensure that sufficient safeguards are in place to prevent the abuse of the blue badge system. I have seen occasions where a blue badge has been used by relatives or friends rather than the actual person the badge was intended for. And I know that a lot of authorities are making a lot of, going to a lot of pain to try and redress this issue, but I think it's an important one. Okay. I, I take on board the point the member is making. Well, Would you also accept that if we are going to widen criteria to allow for individuals, for example, in the autistic spectrum, we need to have proper awareness raising to ensure that those people are not incorrectly identified as blue badge abusers, because while they may appear uh, not to have a disability from a physical uh, pros uh, position, uh, they nonetheless would be people who would require that support. Okay. Yes, presiding officer, I, I take on board um, what Mark is saying. Uh, you're absolutely right, uh, and I wouldn't want to embarrass anybody, particularly uh, if there was a person who actually needed the badge in the first place. Hence, I support the principle that the, the scheme should be widened. Absolutely, I have no uh, hesitation in that whatsoever. However, I also feel that the, the staff of the various authorities need to have the appropriate training to, to handle the situation on the ground. I know I'm, when someone parks in a disabled way, what I don't want to see is somebody opening the door and falling out of the vehicle and, and crawling to wherever they're going. That is not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is that the, ba the badges that are used are used appropriately and we need appropriate training for people to, to carry out their, du their duties. And I think that's important. Thank you very much for writing officer. Thank you very much. And we now move to closing speech from the Minister. Minister, you have seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I first of all express my gratitude to Mr McNeill for bringing this important matter before Parliament today to focus the mind and allow me the opportunity to update Parliament. First of all, I think it's right that we deliver a focus scheme so that the scheme is not overwhelmed and therefore becomes ineffective and is targeted to those who will be able to support. And I think all members' contribution has certainly uh, enlightened that position. The second thing I want to say is something by way of a and an apology, I suppose, to Dennis Roberts and Mark MacDonald, who raised the specific issue of terminology and language to which I agree. Some of the terminology I use in my contribution 
It is terminology I would not use, but it hangs on the legislation. Therefore, accuracy, I have to use a term such as mental disorder, which is not how I would choose to describe um, such uh, conditions. But if you forgive me, presiding officer, I will do so for the sake of at least legislative uh, competency. But do not underestimate uh, the sensitivity of the, the subject. Uh, the Blue Badge Scheme and the parking concessions it provides help people across the country access essential lifeline services, many of which would be unobtainable without the use of a badge. There are approximately 228,000 blue badges in issue in Scotland, and in managing the scheme we must ensure that badges are available to those most in need and that badge holders have the ability to park where they need to. And That is why the Scottish Government supported Dennis Robertson's Disabled Persons parking badges bill that came into effect earlier this year. That act, of course, is focused on enforcement and uh, the circumstances and the clampdown on fraud uh, and misuse. And that demonstrates our continued support to ensure that the scheme is best serving those who have a genuine need to use it. With regards to eligibility, I think it is important to set out for clarity the different ways in which someone can be eligible for a blue badge uh, currently. A badge can be issued either without assessment, generally where the applicant receives a passport from another benefit such as a DLA or a PIP, or following assessment by a local authority. The scheme has gone through a significant reform process over the last few years, uh, with change with eligibility assessments conducted by local authorities focused on those, as members have described, those who are unable to walk or virtually unable to walk. And at the same time, independent mobility assessments were introduced a Great Britain-wide database was set up and enforcement powers were strengthened through last year's Act. However, some of the most significant changes to the scheme have happened uh, as a result of the UK Government's welfare reform uh, changes, as Cameron uh, Buchanan has also mentioned. And when the personal independence payment was introduced to replace disability living allowance, the Scottish Government set out to maintain eligibility as far as possible for those previously in receipt of the higher rate mobility component of DLA. In 2013, we introduced regulations so that anyone awarded PIP at 12 points for the planning and, and following journeys activity or eight points or more for the moving around activity would be eligible. However, as the different benefits have different assessment criteria, achieving parity was not entirely possible. That is why in 2014 we took the additional step of ensuring that those previously in receipt of a lifetime or indefinite HMRC DLA award would remain eligible. Alongside this suite of reforms, we have also commissioned the call for evidence that Mr McFeel, uh, McNeil has referred to. Uh, we have been referring to today to specifically look at extending the scheme to include those who, as a result of a diagnosed mental disorder, have little or no awareness of the danger from traffic. The aim of this consultation was to gather views on the viability of extending the scheme, as members have requested, uh, whether an extension was needed, and to identify challenges to implementing such an extension. An analysis of the responses to the consultation has been published, did, support, uh, did show support for the scheme, and it was clear that extending the scheme would bring benefits to people with a range of mental disorders and would have a practical and positive effect on both the individuals and their immediate family and their carers by decreasing the level of anxiety. One issue, however, what, that was raised through the call for evidence was, as has been described, the potential discrepancy in eligibility for under 16-year-olds. So while PIP is replacing DLA for people aged between 16 and 64, DLA remains in place for under 16s. As both are assessed in different ways, this means that there is a potential inconsistency which mostly affects those with mental health conditions between different routes into the system. So as a result of the issues raised through the call for evidence, setting up the working group was important to work with local authority, blue badge, administration staff, health and social care professionals and representatives from disability organisations. The group is reviewing the evidence gathered, considering the barriers relating to extending eligibility and seeking to identify the ways in which to overcome these with the aim of ensuring, as far as is possible, parity between those who are assessed via local authorities and those who passport from other benefits. And I can tell you that the working group held its first meeting in July of this year. The second meeting is planned for next week. The group do need to ensure that any changes do not have an adverse impact on other parts of the scheme, and I very much look forward to hearing of the recommendations in due course. I thank members for their contributions, which will also help inform that, and I can advise members, since I have not had an intervention, which I was anticipating, uh, that that work shall be... 
uh, well, be careful what you wish for in this place. I'll yes, Ms Robertson. <laughs> <laughs> I thank the Minister. Uh, well, the Minister, in setting out the timetable, basically will take on, to, uh, take on board, hopefully, the uh, results of the consultation and uh, maybe uh, look at ways we can have cognitive assessments um, included uh, for those uh, that may be eligible for badges. I think the Minister hopefully will acknowledge that we are not seeking a blue badge eligibility for every person with Down syndrome or every person with autism. And indeed, that cognitive assessment must take into account a person's ability to perhaps uh, be safe when unescorted. So I sincerely hope the Minister will be able to put a timeline and maybe be able to advise us as to whether or not uh, the bill can be amended and, if so, how long that process may take. Minister. I'm very grateful for that intervention because it then poses the question which I was then going on to answer, which was of assistance to Mr McNeill as well, which is around the time scale issue as well. We can debate how long it's taken to get to this place, but what's important now is the progress I think that we can make. So to answer that question, yes, of course, everyone who's eligible may not take up that eligibility to seek the, the blue badge, but certainly want to be as supportive as we can where they want to do that. Uh, so that's a, a helpful contribution. On timescales, I understand the working group should have its work concluded by November. My commitment to the Chamber is to, to take any relevant legislative approach as soon as I can after that. But it may be possible in terms of guidelines, only may be possible, I need to seek further guidance, that we may not require legislative change to achieve some of that. And if that is the case, then I'll execute that um, as quickly as possible to, to deliver this uh, as, as effectively, efficiently and quickly as I possibly can, presiding officer. Thank you very much and thank you all for taking part in this important debate. I now suspend this meeting of Parliament.